Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fitness Myths. My name is Caitlin Hennessy. I'm the program coordinator here at Global Connections. And our goal at Global Connections is to provide engaging extracurricular programming for global campus students wherever they have an internet connection. And tonight presenting is Ramon Sedano. He is a master trainer as well as the coordinator for Wellbeing Online. And he's gonna address some common fitness myths and questions at the beginning of the night, but feel free to bring your own questions and put them in the chat box at any point and Ramon will address them. And if you do have any technical difficulties throughout the evening, please do let me know in the chat or send me an email at global.connections at wc.edu and I'll do my best to help you. Thank you so much and Ramon's gonna get started. All right, hey everyone. Uh, so again, my name is Ramon Sedano. I am the coordinator for fitness services and education at Washington State University, and I also oversee the Wellbeing Online program that we have here. Um, I have been a strength conditioning coach and personal trainer since 2006. I got my uh, undergrad in kinesiology with a focus on health, fitness, and education here at WSU, and I also got my master's in sport management here. Um, I've done very in-depth research when it comes to functional movement and uh, the uh, ability to uh, implement policies utilizing certain screens like that. So I have a lot of uh, research and a lot of uh, experience in the functional movement kind of movement. Um, I would like to announce I have kind of a phone a friend here with me because I'm kind of doing everything off the top of my head. I have my girlfriend, Dina Miocevic here. She's also a master trainer and she's actually a professor of kinesiology here. So if there is at some point at the end when we have a myth that comes up, if I don't know the answer, I will uh, ask her if she might, she might know a little bit more about it than I do. And if we ever do come to something that I don't know off the top of my head, what I will do is we'll make sure that Caitlin writes it down and I'll go find a reliable resource that will have the answer to that question or that myth. And I'll make sure that we get that information out to the individual and to everybody who is watching uh, the webinar as well. So how we're going to do this is uh, I have a series of questions that are kind of based off of myths that were given to me by the Global Campus uh, Student Ambassadors. So I'll run through a lot of those and I'll answer those questions and a lot of them kind of a uh, uh, pair off one another, so I'll combine those. And then at the end, um, if you have any questions of, or myths that you want busted or talked about, feel free to enter those in the chat box to uh, Caitlin, and we'll kind of go over those as well. So really, this is completely a free-for-all. I'm down, we're, we're completely down to go over everything. Getting with some of the myths that we have right now. Uh, the first question is, should you stretch before and after a workout? And um, we get talked about or asked about stretching and stuff all the time in the fitness realm because a lot of people hear now that stretching is useless. Uh, so first and foremost, stretching is not useless, but sometimes it is misguided and used at times when it doesn't need to be done, essentially. So it is very important to warm up for your workouts, right? And usually when you do a warm up, you're not going to be doing some sort of static stretching. And static stretching is where you're, you know, stretching your hamstring for 30 to 60 seconds for a long period of time. Usually before your workout, you're going to want to do some sort of uh, dynamic mobility uh, exercise. And that is really, you know, using the body through the range of motion at the joints that you're going to be using in that exercise. So before the workout, even though some of those mobility drills may look like stretching to you or static stretching, they're not actually what we consider static stretching in the uh, uh, exercise in, uh, kinesiology realm. But you do want to make sure to do some sort of dynamic mobility before exercising and some sort of warm up. Typically, though, if you want to get the most bang for your buck for your workout and stretching, you will hold off that static stretching until after the workout. Um, there are some contraindications that come up with doing a lot of static stretching before uh, an exercise routine begins because it can elongate the muscle and possibly get you stretched out to a point where you don't want your end range of motion there because your body isn't ready to utilize that. But for the most part, putting those static stretching at the end of your workout is completely fine. Or if you have a day where you're, one of your main focuses really is to increase your flexibility, then you may have a day where you do lots of static stretching. Um, it's just important to remember that mobility uh, is a, has many components to it, and one of those components is flexibility. So your flexibility may actually, it, it could be a drawback or it could enhance your mobility as well. So again, to put that simply, the most important thing to do is to have your static stretching be at the end of your workout if you are going to incorporate some sort of static stretching. And again, make sure to warm up and do a dynamic mobility if you know what those are uh, before your workout. And with that, honestly, we should talk about that on, is it April 26th? 
April 18th. April 18th, we're hosting a webinar, and it's going to be a step-by-step -step process of how to properly warm up. I have a four-part a four part component uh, warm-up series that I've researched in depth, and it's a great way to do a proper warm-up. And we'll go over two ways to do it, to implement it in that uh, webinar. So, again, that's April 16th or 18th? 18th. April 18th. Um, so make sure to come to that. So that was our first question. Uh, the second question is, can you run slash walk daily or do you need rest days in between? So with this and kind of with a lot of things that we're going to talk about, the answer to all these questions is it depends. OK, and that's really with everything. There is no absolutes. Uh, there's no absolutes really in the world. There's no absolutes when it comes to like exercise and fitness and things like that. So this will really depend on where your current fitness level is at the time. If you are somebody who does not run or does not walk at all and you're just getting into some sort of exercise routine and say that briskly walking is extremely hard for you and it really is, you know, wearing down your body, you're definitely going to need days where you rest. OK, the same goes for running. If that running is a pretty strenuous on your body or that exercise, exercise in general, you, let's just put it this way. You should definitely rest when you have an exercise routine. Um, the more and more you get adapted to running and those walkings, you, the more rest days, you, uh, the less rest days you will have to take. But it's still imperative for your body to regenerate, to recuperate and to optimize itself the best as possible to take those rest days. Um, and once you get pretty high up in it, it's you can probably go six days a week, but it's still very, very important to have that one day rest. Would you agree? OK. Dino is an ex-track athlete, so she knows a little bit more about the running and all that stuff than I do. Um, but regardless, if you're in some sort of exercise routine, you should incorporate rest days. Your body needs time to regenerate, recover, and rebuild. OK. If you're constantly putting your body in a state of stress, and not giving it time to adapt and rebuild from itself, you're only going to beat yourself down and you're not going to optimize whatever you're trying to do. Okay. Question number three is, can you work out your abs daily or do you need to rest in between? So I would not recommend you to do the same ab routine six or seven days a week. Uh, there's lots of things that are bad from that, but, uh, the further, the deeper and deeper you get into the fitness realm or learning about exercise science, you understand that your abs are not exactly just the six pack you see on the surface level. Your core and the musculature on your pelvic floor and around your spine and what we want to train our abs as is a way to support the lumbar spine. That's why those muscles are really, really there is to make sure that there's no shearing force that happens on the lumbar spine because that's where you have a lot of degenerative disc issues, fit this, bulging this, all those kinds of things. So with that, a lot of the multi uh, uh, or the multi joint exercises or the compound lifts that you do, like a back squat, a deadlift, even a bench press, those things that take multiple joints into use, you're having to utilize your abs and the core musculature to stabilize the spine. So you're actually training your abs in those ways. Um, that's why I do find it a bit ridiculous that when you see people always constantly train their abs with a bunch of V-ups and Russian twists and crunches and all that, those things will help that superficial level, but it's not going to really optimize what your core musculature is supposed to do. If you do have an ab routine to really train that surface level stuff, I would recommend just to do that once a week. There's no reason to do it six, seven days a week. If you wanted to do some sort of ab exercise each day or have some have it implemented into your program, it would be important to understand how to break down what those movements are. And when we think about training our core, we can think of training in an anti-extension or an anti-rotation kind of way, okay? And then we can make those dynamic if we want. So you could implement anti-extension exercises as an act of rest in your routine on day one, and then maybe do anti-extension or anti-rotation, whatever you didn't do the day before, and then you could flip off those so you're not consistently always just taxing the one movement or the one muscle group over and over and over again. Another problem with doing an ab routine every single day is that you're going to create a very, very strong, like, you know, front side, and it's going to be overcompensated compared to the back side, right? And you're, what's going to happen is you're going to shorten your hip, play, especially if you're doing just general ab routine exercises like crunches and V-ups and things like that. You're going to shorten your hip flexors, and it's going to be real tight in front. It's going to put a lot of strain on your low back, and it's not going to, it's, it may look good, but it's not going to perform good. 
So it's important to make sure to utilize these exercises in the most functional way possible. That's going to make your body perform at its best. Um, but if you do have an ab routine that you love and you have an ab day, just do it once a week. It's going to be good enough, especially if you have other exercises in your routine like squats and deadlifts and cleans and all that stuff because that's going to engage the core musculature as well. Um, yeah, cool. Next question is, is it more important to focus on diet or exercise in terms of weight management? Simply put, diet is more important in terms of weight management. However, both these things, uh, they, uh, they help one another, okay? So the simplest way to think about weight management is your calories in versus your calories out. Um, everybody has a basal metabolic rate and everybody has a total daily energy expenditure. And what those two things mean is your basal metabolic rate is the amount of calories that your body burns when you do throughout the day with without any other activity put on top of it. So I sat in this chair all day and I didn't do anything. All the household keeping tasks that need to be done, like my digestion, my posture, anything like to fuel my muscles, fuel my blinking, whatever is going on, all that is a source of needs energy, right? And that's my basal metabolic rate. On top of that, when I do my activity, I go, I walk to class, I uh, do my workout routine, all those things add on top of it and that becomes my total daily energy expenditure. There is ways to uh, calculate what that is to give yourself a rough number. So if you get that number, to be able to maintain at it, you're going to be able to maintain your weight. Below it, you're going to be able to lose your weight. And if you go above it, you're going to gain weight. And it's really easy to manipulate that with nutrition, right? So that's the easiest way for weight management. However, if your goal is to gain weight and you want to gain lean mass, just eating more is not going to do that. You're going to need to put some stress on the muscles to break them down, bring the food in to then breathe, build that muscle up more and get that lean muscle mass on yourself. Also, if your goal is to lose weight or to in, uh, is to lose weight, you can increase your basal metabolic rate by adding muscle mass on your body. Because the more muscle mass I have in my body, the more energy my body requires, and thus that basal metabolic rate, and then my total daily energy, energy expenditure will be higher, and I'm able to cut weight a little bit easier, or I can eat more and maintain weight, okay? So the more muscle mass you have on your body, which will be achieved through weight training, is going to be able to increase that basal metabolic rate, and in turn, increase that total daily energy expenditure, thus helping you with the weight management, whatever it is that you may do. So they very much complement one another, but if you're gonna ask which one is more important, monitoring your nutrition is more important. Okay, is there any questions I need to answer so far? We do have a couple questions when you're ready. Okay, we can do some of those before we get too far from these. Okay, Yeah. so one person asked, can you have, or can you give a few examples of what exactly is a static stretch, like toe touches, IT band stretches? So imagine I did a toe touch and I held it for 30 seconds. That's, that's a, I'm sorry, can they, they can hear you, correct? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So yeah, if I did a toe touch and I held it for 30 seconds, that would be an example of a static stretch. However, if I did something that was much uh, involved a toe touch, but then I walked out to a push-up position, then I did a deep lunge, and then I came back and I wasn't holding something for a long period of time, and I was really working my uh, uh, joints around their natural range of motion, that would be considered more of a mobility exercise. But if you're gonna think about static stretching, think about you're stretching one muscle for a long period of time. So you're trying to isolate one muscle and stretch that for 30 to 60 seconds usually. And we did have another question. Um, what is a good work rest ratio? Is it like six to one or what would you recommend? So work to rest ratio, is this with regards to weight training? I think this is in regards in the frequency of exercise like days off. Oh, for, for that, um, that again, it depends on what your current training status is. Okay, so uh, how able you are to intake exercise without beating yourself down, what your goals are, right? Are you trying to be a marathon runner? Are you trying to be a power lifter? Are you trying to be, you know, an Olympic lifter? Um, then uh, your schedule, honestly, just who you are, like what your day looks like, all that depends. But I would say for most general population, if you have a little bit of an exercise background, honestly, getting if you're doing strength training routine, mix in with some cardio, four to five days a week is great, right? Honestly, I train four days a week, and then I have a fifth day that's a recovery day, and that's that's pretty good for me. And I've been my training eighty sixteen now because I started do exercise or doing weight training at age fourteen. So um, it just really depends on what your status is and. Uh, 
it's not one of those things where more is better. Being smarter is better. And the easiest way to do it, listen to your body. Okay. If you're really, really sore, you know, maybe give yourself that other day of rest. And again, if it's just your lower body is really sore and you've already rested two days, maybe do an upper body workout, right? But four to five days a week is pretty good for general population. But again, you might need to build up to that. You might be two days a week. It might be three days a week. But uh, for the most part, if you can get to that four to five, that's pretty good. That's good. Is that it? Mm -hmm. well, those are the questions for now. So we'll keep moving on. Um, okay, number five. Is it better to work out every day? For, okay, this kind of goes off what we were just talking about. This is good. So is it better to work out every day for shorter time spans or to do more challenging workouts with rest days in between? Again, this is going to go on. It depends. And there's multiple things that this depends on, right? If your schedule calls for you only being able to do some short, short duration workout, then you probably want to focus on short workouts. If your goal is to be a power lifter or an Olympic lifter, your workouts are going to have to be a little bit longer because the modalities that you're going to try to increase through the energy systems that are needed for those modalities, you, they're going to take a longer period of time. The one thing within this question that I want to address is it says, is it better to do work out every day for shorter time spans or to do more challenging workouts with rest days in between? If you are going to do a shorter duration workout, that workout should actually most likely be hot and high, have a higher intensity. OK, usually when people are going to train in a shorter duration period of time, it's going to be focused on much higher intensity, get the same bang for their buck that they could if they were doing a longer workout. So I would suggest if you were going to do short, intense workouts, that you would still also involve rest days. I would never say not to have a rest day, whether you're doing short duration or long duration workouts. OK, and again, if your goal is to do weight loss, is to lose weight and you only had 15 to 20 minutes each day and you couldn't go on the Stairmaster for an hour or something like that, which is it's another story. You would want to make that workout like an interval style of training, right? Make it high intensity, get the heart rate real high, really train that blood lactate threshold and push the boundaries. OK, you want to get the most bang from your the most bang from your workout in that short amount of time. So you're most likely going to increase the intensity. And honestly, those longer workouts will probably be much lower in intensity because you're able to increase more volume and get that same benefit. But in a long period of time without having to do super, super hard. Again, each one of those modalities is going to have a different uh, like end goal from it, and uh, that's fine. But the simplest way to put it is you should have rest days, I guess is the easiest way to say it. Um, okay. Number six is what are the best foods to eat before and after a workout? So this is a huge question, and uh, there's lots of things that can go into it. And uh, we're not going to get into lots of the nitty gritty because there's certain, you know, calculations that you should eat this many grams of this one to two hours before and this many grams of this three hours before. Um, for the most part, if you were going to eat something before a workout, you should try to eat it, you know, one to two hours before and kind of focus on like, uh, you know, a rich carbohydrate and a rich protein meal. Like a little bit more, more carbohydrates, honestly, than you would have protein. Um, and another thing is it kind of depends, like, does eating before the workout make you nauseous? Does it make you bloated? Does it make you not actually work out as well? Like, there needs to be things that are said, like, if you don't like eating before your workout, you shouldn't do it if it affects your workout. Um, regardless, you need to have adequate nutrition throughout the day to make sure that your workout, um, you know, has the most optimization that it possibly can. But if you were going to eat before a workout, one to two hours before with a good protein source and a good carbohydrate source would be really good. You want to make sure if you are eating 15 to 45 minutes before eating or drinking before a workout, you want to avoid those things that are, have a really, uh, that are very, very sugary, a very high glycemic index carbohydrate. And I learned this today due to Dina sending me actually some power. She teaches sports nutrition and stuff like that is what happens is uh, due to the fact that you're intaking a very you know simple sugar, it goes into the bloodstream right away. And then what happens when you uh, ingest sugar, it turns into glucose in the body and insulin is released. And insulin is kind of the carrier of glucose to take it where it needs to go. So if you do this 15 to 45 minutes right before a workout, all that insulin is going to be dumped out and it's going to uptake all that sugar. So you actually might have a hypoglycemic, so a blood sugar, like a low blood sugar going into the workout, which you do not want because you need the main source of energy during your exercise is glucose. So 
usually when you are eating before, you want to make sure it's an hour or two before, and it's a good, you know, it's rich in carbs and protein. Honestly, a, a lower glycemic index, so more of a complex carbohydrate is a little bit better. And uh, if you do want to know kind of the ratios of gram per kilogram of body weight that's recommended by certain organizations, I have that stuff written down that Dina sent me earlier that we can go over. Um, but it is important not to be malnourished when you go into a workout make sure that you have some sort of energy inside of you okay and then uh it also talks about after a workout after your workout you want to continue with whatever you figured out your total daily uh that your total uh caloric intake is continue to ingest you know for how many um uh, calories you need afterwards and uh spread it out a little bit if you can and uh honestly but if right after the workout to be able to replenish yourself, you can definitely take in a high glycemic index or a, a, a simple carbohydrate right afterwards because you're usually pretty depleted and you can just uh, ramp up those uh, carbohydrates and glucose in your body. And it's good, again, to eat like, a little bit of protein afterwards. There's only so much protein that can be processed when you do eat it. Um, so continuing that throughout the night after the workout to help rebuild those muscles. Um, is there anything else I should add to that at this moment? Just eat and make sure you're not malnourished. Um, don't go into a workout starving. If you notice yourself like being really, getting really hungry during your workout or getting the shakes during your workout or feeling really lightheaded, that may be a sign of you having a hypoglycemic reaction. And that might be telling you, that might be a sign that, okay, I need to increase my food intake before my workout. And uh, just kind of listen to your body on that. With regard to like uh, hydration and stuff like that before a workout, the simplest way, and this is what I tell everybody, is you just you can monitor your hydration level by just monitoring your urine. Okay, to be to be blunt about it, as long as you have a flow that is you know clear or semi yellowish, you're pretty good. I'm sorry, we're getting a little you know a little, a little raunchy here, but if it's clear or looking a little yellowish, you're good. You're hydrated. Once it starts getting that real dark tint of yellow, it's showing that you're you're dehydrated and you need to uh, uh, start uh, taking that in. Um, after your workout, it is important. It was uh, you need to replenish. So if I was 150 pounds before my workout and I lost two pounds to sweat, I need to replenish that by 120 to 150 percent of water intake afterwards. And I learned that one pound is equivalent to 0.5 liters. So whatever 120 to 150 percent is of that two pounds in uh, liters, is what you would intake afterwards. Oh, or one pint thank you um and beforehand there's there's tips and tricks you can do for hydration but i would just suggest to uh monitor your uh urine level what was it uh what did you tell me for throughout the day for under 30 and over 30. um up to at least three liters so if you're so under 30 years old to three liters under 30 and then close to four liters which is about a gallon uh, over 30. Okay, so if your age is 30 and below, 1.9 to 3 liters daily is a good source of water intake. And then above 30 years old? About 3.7 liters, which is about a gallon. About 3.7 liters daily, which is about a gallon. Um, again, any fluids, not just water. Any fluids. And uh, again, this is all uh, getting like a nitty gritty about it. Just drink water. Just drink water throughout the day and you'll be hydrated and you'll be okay. We have a couple questions very related to this right now. Okay. Um, so these two you can probably pair together, but Emily asks, what are your thoughts on pre-workout drinks? And then also Heather asks, I have heard that caffeine can help increase the effectiveness of a workout, but doesn't that also contribute to dehydration? So pre-workouts, um, the main reason most people take pre-workout drinks is due to the caffeine in it, because it gets you hyped up for the workout and it makes you want to be able to like go real hard. But if you look at certain labs that make pre-workout drinks, there's much more that goes into creating a pre-workout than just putting the caffeine in there. What it does is it preps the muscles and preps the energy systems that are going to be able to be optimized to the best ability that they can throughout the workout. Um, what I would suggest though, when it comes to pre-workout drinks is if you don't need it now, don't take it, right? There's no, uh, there's really no need for it. I say that, but I love pre-workout, but it's because I'm addicted to caffeine and I'll admit that. Um, and then the thing with caffeine, possibly dehydrating you, it's because caffeine can act as a diuretic and increase your uh, uh, urine output. It actually takes an extreme amount of it to be able to uh, cause that dehydration to kick into play. 
um, you should add on with that more. You know more about. Uh, it would, uh, most healthy adults can tolerate about 400 milligrams of caffeine a day. Um, general one scoop of pre-workout, just depending on the brands, but most of them have about 300 milligrams. So that could be okay for most healthy individuals. Um, venti cup of coffee from Starbucks, just a drip coffee, has about 480 milligrams of caffeine anyways. So um, that would be a, if we were to consume about nine cups of cups of coffee, because 400 milligrams, it's about about four cups of coffee per day. Uh, if we were about to consume about nine, that would be a potentially detrimental thing about dehydration and possibly death. Too. Yeah, yeah, when you're getting so, really up there. Um, but anything lower than that, um, 400 milligrams, which is the most healthy active individuals, um, it's not going to cause any major issues with dehydration. Yeah, so, um, and uh, these are, are really getting into those high numbers too. Uh, but if you don't take a pre workout and you don't feel like you, need it for optimizing yourself. I just wouldn't take it. Like I, uh, I like, I like my, uh, pre-workout kick in the morning, but again, it's risk versus reward for the most part. You're gonna be all right. Honestly, if you drink that coffee and you continue drinking water throughout the day, you're most likely going to be okay. You just got to monitor it. It's except that a lot of pre-workouts is not caffeine. That's our concern. Yeah. So other thermogenics, they're placed inside. A lot of people have different reaction in terms of, um, diarrhea or upset stomach or even vomiting. It's not due to high concentrations of caffeine. It's just all the whole bunch of different ingredients mixed together. That's actually a really important point and we should make a plug on certain things. So a lot of time when you're getting certain supplements, you, there's two things that can happen. Well, there's multiple things. There's, let's say there's three things that can happen. What's on the label is actually in there, right? In the, in the record, in the amounts they said that it's supposed to be in there. Those things are actually in there. Another thing that can happen is what's on the label is not in there. You're actually just getting something that's like straight sugar or, you know, nothing of what is actually in there because they, we don't have, they don't have to regulate their supplements. And Number three, there could be things in there that you don't know because they don't want to tell you because they're illegal and they're going to actually make their supplement look better. So a lot of people who are like uh, NCAA athletes, pro fighters, things like that, they get tested positive for, you know, some sort of a performance enhancement drug because they're taking a supplement that's tainted and they don't know that it's actually in there. And that's the actual thing that's making this supplement work. So there's certain labs out there that you can purchase supplements from that will help you identify what is in there is actually in there. And the best way to go through is get NSF certified uh, uh, supplements. Those are the ones that are regulated by like the International Olympic Committee and NCAA and stuff. So where they're going to have no banned substances in there and what is in there is actually in there. Now there's going to be certain things that you can't get through NSF like certified because uh, there's certain things that are banned in NCAA or the Olympics that are cool for us to use. It's just and it, 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 it's not going to be super detrimental, but you still want to know that what's on the label is going to be in the supplement. There's other labs out there, and the one I know off the top of my head is called the GMB. And if it has if your supplement has a GMB stamp on it, what is on the label is most likely is going to be in there. Again, they don't test every single batch, right? They're going to come in and surprise the, the vendor, take what they have right there, test it, and make sure that it's adequate to what they say. So a lot of things with supplements, right? A lot of things can come up with supplements. And on that supplement note, um, Chloe asks, what are your thoughts on protein powder? So when it comes to protein, I say you should just get it from your food sources, unless you're a vegetarian and it's very difficult to come by. But if you can, it, the best way to get protein is through is through animal flesh. Honestly, it has a complete amino acid profile, um, and uh, it, it's just what the body meant. I'm all about. If any of you are coming to Rendezvous, you're gonna and you want to come to my uh, workshop. It's called How to Shop for Real Food. I'm all about JERF, and that stands for Just Eat Real Food. So I'm not big into supplements. The only supplement that I actually do take is the pre-workout, and it's only honestly just from caffeine. It's not from all the other things. I hate to admit it, but uh, it. All your nutrients, you should try to get them from a well-balanced diet. And I think that you should try to get your protein from, you know, some sort of nutritional source. 
Uh, with that, there's a couple of ways, times that I do say that it's okay to get, you know, a protein powder or something like that. That's if you're an athlete and it's really difficult to get the amounts of protein that you need in. Because sometimes, like I've had athletes that need to take in 350 to 400 milligrams, not milligrams, but grams of protein. And that's very hard to do just from like, you know, eating uh, foods. Then again, if you're a vegetarian um, and it's hard for you to get those whole protein sources uh, or the, that have a complete amino acid complex, uh, taking a protein supplement at that time would be is nice. Or if it's just like you know it's a quick way and, so, and you want to get it in quickly, you have to run to work and maybe after your workout you have a protein powder with some simple carbohydrate mix in it with like some you know ground up greens and some fruit and some ice or something for your uh, post shake. That's all right, but again, I would still recommend trying to get it from food. I think the best way to be able to obtain any nutrient for the body is to get that nutrient in the way that the body intended, and that's not through a synthetic form. That's through what we have grown and come to eat by becoming humans that we are now. Is that all of them so far? That's all of them right now. Okay. Um. Supplements are a fun one, and if you guys are coming to Rendezvous, we're both, uh, Dina's coming with me too. She actually does research on uh, supplements. That's like her area of uh, study, so she has a lot of information on that, um, and she'll be there with me too, so make sure to come talk to us. The next question is, are there different ways to train for different outcomes when it comes to weightlifting? More specifically, is there a way to lift weights to improve strength versus a way to lift weights to add bulk? The answer is yes, and the answer is go watch my build building your own program uh, webinar. But uh, no, we'll talk it. Uh, so there is definitely different protocols that you can do to increase endurance for your muscle, to increase hypertrophy, which is the bulk of your muscle, and to increase strength for your muscle. And typically, the least volume that you have, so if I was doing like one to three reps, that's I'm trying to strain, I'm training for strength and power, okay? Um, and those usually come with like, you know, more sets. So it'd be like five sets, of one to three reps with long periods of breast break uh, with a rest period because of what I'm doing is I'm taxing my central nervous system and I'm utilizing all my strength and power and velocity and everything to complete this and for those systems that energy system that's being utilized uh, at that standpoint which is your phosphogen creatine system it takes about is it two to five minutes to replenish uh, creatine phosphate yes yeah, three to five uh, no that's ATP it takes about three to five minutes to replenish your ATP mm -hmm. And it takes about eight minutes to completely replenish. That's right. Process. That's right. Um, okay, so those low rep here, those low rep ratios. So it's going to be a low rep ratio with a large amount of sets with a long rest period. That's for strength and power. When we go up to hypertrophy, now we're looking anywhere from that, uh, honestly, eight to twelve reps. Because when you're doing six reps, you're still kind of in strength. You're definitely still in strength. So I would honestly say eight to fifteen reps is a good range for hypertrophy. The books are gonna tell you eight to 12, but 15, depending on how what your training age and stuff is gonna get you there. And typically you're gonna be doing anywhere from two to four sets with that, and then you have a moderate rest break, right? You're gonna have a 90 second to two minute, or 60 second to two minute rest break, and that's, and we're being real general right now. We could break, and if you watch the How to Build Your Own uh, program, Beginner's Edition, we really break this down with like literally visuals of everything and stuff in there too. It's a really good uh, webinar, honestly. So again, that uh, eight to 12 to 15 rep ratio with moderate sets and moderate rest period, that's good for hypertrophy. And then when you want to train for endurance, you're going to go 15 reps and above and your rest periods are going to be 30 to 60 seconds. Okay. Um, again, Build Your Own Workout Beginners Edition is honestly one of the better webinars that I've put on. It comes with an entire, uh, it, it teaches you how to build your own program specifically for what those goals may be. I completely go through these rep protocols and things like that. And then at the end, I teach you how to utilize a four-week, a four-day split template that I have created for you that I teach you how to use it in the webinar. And then in the video of all is literally the uh, attachment to the four-day split where you can build your own program. And it doesn't, you don't need to know exercises or anything in the four-day split. There's drop-down lists in each one of the sections that has tons of exercises that fit in a certain area and has videos to all those things so you can help you build your own program. So I definitely recommend checking that out. I literally give it to my personal trainers here. My new personal trainers who have never trained before, they have to use that four-day split when they train with people because I know it's put together in a good way. So look into those. Um, was there a question with that? There is a question going back slightly to um, protein. Okay. Carly asks, 
what are your thoughts about taking branched chain amino acids? I think taking branched chain amino acids is a very good thing to do. In all honesty, I would say I would take an EAA complex, which is essential amino acids. But take your BCAAs, take your EAAs. Dina would agree. I know she would agree. Um, if you, uh, I, have no, I have no problem. And that's the thing. It's like, so another thing with my pre-workout, I get my BCAAs from my pre-workout. So a lot of pre-workouts have BCAAs and stuff in there. Um, but if I was going to say take BCAAs or EAAs, I would take an EAA complex because it has all the BCAAs in it. That's a lot of A's right now. So EAA is essential amino acids, and then BCAAs is branch chain amino acids. And your uh, essential amino acid uh, supplements out there are going to have the branch chain amino acids in them as well. What it means by essential amino acid is those are just ones that are not produced by your body naturally. So you get all of them in there. What are branch chain amino acids? Well, it's leucine. Uh, what are they? It's leucine. Uh, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And valine. Yeah. And the reason they're called brain chain amino acids is because if we have to tap into protein metabolism for energy, those are the amino acids that are getting metabolized. That's in extreme cases for um, starvation or over exercising at a higher intensity, 90 minutes in duration or longer. But BCAAs will still help out in the rebuild phase. Correct. They help, especially the loosing content. Yeah. Um, so what she's saying right now is that there is a situation that comes up to where you don't have glucose or fat, so, so sugar or fat in your body to be utilized as energy. Your body, and say you're working out, your body will start breaking down. This is not good. You don't want this to happen. Your body will start breaking down your muscle and uh, utilizing that as an energy source. And if you have branched chain amino acids in there, it helps facilitate that without as much destruction, I'm assuming. Yeah, there is a minimal amount of a percentage of protein that it's actually metabolized for energy. No, yes, um, everything works out so once, yes. yeah. Um, but brain chain, if we're sipping through a brain chain amino acids, let's say from like a supplement brain, um, we have a mixture in the water, or um, that should kind of help out with the um, metabolism of protein, and okay. especially those three brain chain amino acids. So that could also help out. And it also, the research showed that uh, branch chain amino acids, especially the leucine content, uh, helps more with the MPS, which is a muscle protein synthesis right after That's the workout, growing the muscles. than actually uh, consuming whey protein or casein. So, it's about the leucine content, honestly, then. There you um, go. So if your goal is to, you know, have that protein synthesis, which just means the building of the muscle after there's been damage to it, the leucine from the branch chain amino acid is going to be more beneficial in that than an actual protein supplement. That's really cool. According to most research on um, muscle protein synthesis, anyways. I did not know that actually. That's really cool. Um, so yeah, I'm a I'm a big proponent of uh, BCAAs. Um, again, you you can get them in all kinds of different ways though. Is there any other questions? Okay. Cool. These are really good questions. You also keep them coming. Like we, we don't mind. I'm very glad I have her here. Uh, she knows way because the thing is I don't. I'm just not big into supplements, so I never did a lot of research into them. And having her as a research hub for it has helped me out so much when I do want to take something. Um, okay. The next question is: Running always bad for your knees, or is there a way to prevent knee injury and still run? Um, so the answer is, if you have good form when you run, you're probably not going to damage your knees. Uh, the thing is, most of us don't have good form when we run, and a lot of us have bodies that are structured in a way that don't elicit proper form to be put into play right away without some sort of coaching. So the one thing with long distance running, it is one of those exercises that is the most wear and tear on your body. A lot of long distance runners have the most, uh, like, kind of, they have nagging injuries all the time because it's just so excessive and all the time and it's just constant pounding, constant pounding. And I think it's like when you run and like hit the ground, it's like eight times your body weight hitting down each time that you, I forget, like Dr. Uh, my orthopedic surgeon was telling me about that. But uh, if you have good running form and you have the body for it, it's not going to hurt you, but it's developing proper running form. And then also building up and not like if I haven't ran five miles, I'm not going to go out and run five miles tomorrow. It is building up my body to have that musculature that is important for that, for the shock absorption, and teach my body how to do that. So you'd also not need to have that good running form, but you would need to build yourself correctly without just jumping into the lines and uh, doing something that's going to hurt yourself. So a slow periodized program where you add on a little bit more and add on a little bit more will be good. Dina actually uh, 
taught a webinar that was how to train for a uh, uh, 5k 10k and beyond uh, last summer and it's on our video vault too where she talks about a lot of the modalities uh, that or a lot of the ways that you can uh, train for a long distance event and uh, she goes over exercises that will help with that too because there's certain strength and uh, strength training routines that will help put you in a uh, better proper position to where you're not going to cause so much damage to your knees and stuff for the most part when it comes to uh, doing cardiovascular activities or trying to get my cardio with my clients or something I don't do long distance stuff just because it is so much wear and tear on the body. I don't have people go out and run. What I try to do is, again, I try to get the most bang for my buck for anything I do for myself or for my clients. So I like to do that interval training where I get my heart rate up real high and then I bring it down real low and then I get it up real high. And I'm only maybe doing a total of 10 minutes of work, uh, if that, because I mean, you can even do like a total of like five to six minutes of work and you are doing at 100% capacity and then resting in 100% capacity. You actually get the same caloric output as you would if you did something for steady state for a long period of time and you get less wear and tear on your body. Also with that, the cool thing about training those uh, interval fashions in that high, high anaerobic way is you're actually able to increase your VO2 max, which is your body's ability to utilize oxygen at the cellular level while not working necessarily in an oxidative system, which is what you do when you do more steady state, long distance cardio kind of stuff. Um, and that's for the fact that you're actually training at your blood lactate threshold. So your blood lactate threshold is the simplest way. If you're doing a bunch of curls and all of a sudden you can't do any more, that's because your blood lactate is completely taken over the muscle and you can't do any more. But if you rest for a little bit, it settles away and then you can do some more. So that blood lactate threshold is completely, it's correlated with uh, these ventilatory thresholds called VT1 and VT2, which correlates to the ability to utilize oxygen at the cellular level. So you're able to do this anaerobic interval training without going into your oxidative system. So you actually save your muscle mass and you're able to increase your VO2 max or your actual, your aerobic system without having to go into your aerobic capacity, which is really cool. And it saves wear and tear on the body. So when you do those interval trainings, you're able to, so to back up a little bit, uh, a lot of things that you hear is when people do a lot of cardio or a lot of long distance cardio is they sacrifice uh, muscle mass from it. Um, which is true to an extent, but it's not, don't think that if you do a steady state that you're going to lose all your muscle, but it is true to an extent, but in a way to avoid that, say if you are a strength and power athlete or you are a bodybuilder and you want to maintain as much lean muscle mass as possible, you're able to train in this really high anaerobic fashion to increase not only your anaerobic threshold, but your aerobic threshold, which is that, you know, oxidative system while not sacrificing the lean muscle mass that you're trying to, uh, hold on to. Did that make sense or did that go off too deep? You did go off too deep. Okay. Is there questions I see you writing? Um, one question to follow up on that is, so is HIIT training better than weightlifting? Uh, well, no, but yes and no. It, it, they're different things, right? Uh, HIIT training is going to, is exactly what I'm talking about right now is that interval training, right? But, and you can do it with some types of weight training. You could. Uh, I would rather do maybe like sprints versus a climb or a salt bike, those kinds of things. So it's going to build that blood. It's going to build your uh, uh, ability. It's going to increase your blood lactate threshold, right? It's going to increase that ventilatory threshold. It's going to be able to let you push farther, but it's not going to be, it's not going to get you what a well-rounded weight training routine would get you as well. Like the best way, a combination of all these things is the best. You shouldn't just do one thing. Like, so the, the way that I in, implement my uh, interval training or my HIIT training in my programs is I do it at the very end, right? I have, and if you if you go to the Build Your Own uh, program webinar, we kind of go through this entire process. But instead of having to do 30 minutes of stair step or on a different day, I'll go through my entire weight training routine. And at the very end, I have just some high intense. And what I usually do is I hop on the Versa Climb or Assault Bike and I'll do like, uh, a 30 second on 30 second off for 10 minutes and then that's my interval so i mix my interval training in with my rate to weight training because one doesn't trump the other they're doing different things and to go back to the running how do i figure out if i have proper running form okay dina just taught me about proper running form so i was a sprinter so i have really good sprint form um uh but we i literally because one of the questions coming on here is what is proper running form so i asked her and uh she's going to chime in when i mess up so most importantly, you want to not like land flat footed, right? Or just completely heel strike. You don't want to run just on your toes. What she explained that you want to do is you want your foot to fall under your center of mass and you're going to initially strike with the front 
edge of your heel, but you're going to roll through, right? You're going to make sure to get that shock absorption, just like if you, know, if you do jujitsu in here, if you break fall, you disperse like the weight, right? So you want to make sure to roll through, but you're not hitting directly on the heel, correct? You're hitting kind of on the front edge of the heel and then you're rolling through and you're trying to minimize your ground contact, correct? Um, and she was kind of explaining to me of when you watch a horse run, like if you see them, they constantly, how'd you explain that? You know, when they push the dirt. Yeah, know, they push the in like the dirt. And they're just on the ground real quickly and it's just rolling through and it's real pretty, honestly. Um, That's the best running form if we're going to actually. Really? It's a horse? Real. Yeah? Yeah, it That's is. Awesome. I mean. And if, uh, you want to make sure, so sprinters, like me, when I sprint, you know, my arm, I'm really, really trucking my arms, right? So when you're doing your longest run, you want relaxed arms, but you still want them going, you know, right arm with left leg, left arm with right leg, but it's much more relaxed and you don't want them crossing the body. With that, you're gonna waste energy like that. So you're trying to be relaxed, have them run, land your foot underneath you at the center, of, uh, underneath your center of mass, which is probably easier said than done. Um, and then make sure to get that roll through. And again, there's a lot that's gonna go into a proper running form. Um, there's places that can give you a gait analysis, and I'm sure there's people around your area that if you want to do some sort of like training, they can help you out there. I, uh, that's, that's where my expertise falls off is long distance running. I was not, I was a sprinter, not a long distance runner. Um, what are some other, is there um, any other key I points? I would also we... suggest for people that are really interested in pursuing running more seriously to really uh, invest their time and maybe some money and to get fitted for the proper running shoes. That's what I was getting. Um, because oftentimes we do pronate um, when we actually go in, mm -hmm. right? We walk in She's or we actually, yeah, well, you we can't see it. So a lot of us actually pronate so you can see it from somebody's like wear and tear on the shoes. When the inside you. of the shoes are kind of wearing off, it means that it's probably over pronation. That could cause a lot of the shin splints a lot of the Achilles tendons and a lot of different um, runners too. Uh, so it's important to get fitted for the shoes that are good for somebody who overpronates. Um, or I'm not too worried about like a supination, all the cost. So here's your pronation, here's your supination. Yeah. So if this is my feet, this is pronating my feet, this is supinating my feet. Um, for the supination, I'm not too worried about as much as I'm worried about pronation, but supination can cause a lot of the um, IT band no, issues. Lateral issues, right? Yeah, yeah, a lot of lateral issues too. So when you get like carmelia crest all the way down to the side of your knee, that it's kind of tight, so you have to roll it out, you have to stretch it. So that's something that could be also um, a huge component to somebody's running form too. And with that, I'd like to say too, so it's, it's cool that you can get shoes that are going to act as a crutch to your over pronation or your over supination, but there's something going on in your body that's causing you to pronate excessively or supinate excessively, okay? And that's when you wanna find somebody like me or a physical therapist or a functional movement specialist who's gonna be able to do a joint by joint approach for you because maybe something's happening at your ankle to where you're supinating a lot, but it's not your ankle's fault. It's something going on at your hip right? And we need to fix that up. And then all of a sudden that gets fixed up. So get the shoes while you're doing it, but then figure out why that issue is part of you and attack it. Cause you don't uh, like doing something like that is like, you're just getting, uh, you're getting the pill, you're getting the pill for the symptom, right? You're not actually fixing the root cause, but sometimes bodies are just a certain way, no matter what. Yeah. Sometimes you're just going to be like super, super or pronated and you, everyone is going to be to a certain degree, but if it's excessive, like i was so bad with external rotation and all kinds of things and it was due to tight hip flexors and my back would always lock up and stuff and like once i did just a couple of corrective strategies and some soft tissue work all of a sudden like my toes were going forward my back wasn't locking up so make sure to also address those issues as well get to the root cause because running is one of the few what i think it's the only activity that goes through open and closed kinetic chain so one joint is always up in the air one is always free to move, one is on the ground. So that's alternating between open and closed kinetic chain. So in a closed kinetic chain, uh, one or more joints are actually not being able to move. So when we our foot is planted on the ground with breaking and ground contact time and breaking capacities too. So that means that um, if one joint is not working properly, if we're having issues with ankles, it could cause shin splints or 
anterior tibialis issues or Achilles tendon issues, that could also lead to uh, misalignment in the knees and the hips. So once we have that contribution to multiple different joints involved in one activity like running, that could cause a lot of the improper forms due to just misalignment and joint in general. Can we just bring Dina over here? Is that cool? Oh, yeah. Dina, get this chair and come over here. Dina's going to join us because I feel like it'd be weird to keep hearing her talk and not see her. Um, is there any questions? Again, well, we're on these topics. I don't mind answering any questions. I kind of like it like this. There is a question that is related to back to the weight lifting. This is Dina. Hello. This is Dina. Um, that goes, what are your thoughts on doing weights continuously, such as no breaks, constant load, until muscle muscle exhaustion, like what Doug McGuff describes mm -hmm. and practices? Um, so when you're doing like your sets to failure, uh, I think is Doug McGuff who wrote Body by uh, Body by Science. I think he might have been the one who wrote that. He does one set to failure for like each muscle group and things like that. Um, those again, that's great. Is it Body by Science? Yeah, I read the. A lot of people do programs from Body by Science in one of your classes actually. Uh, I like it. That's a quick way. It, it works. It really does work, and they have tons of research by it too that says it works. Um, it's not my favorite modality, but if you're an individual who has limited time, that's a great way to go. Okay, and especially for hypertrophy, and you will get uh, a lot of structural integrity from it too, which is kind of cool. Um, uh, I say like don't just focus on one style of training like do McGruff stuff and then maybe do some like boil stuff and then go and focus on maybe some lead tap stuff and some uh you know all the lead taps more the speed and stuff like that but you know incorporate great cooks functional fitness like you know go through different maybe do some louis simmons 531 stuff you know do different programs if you have the time but when you do have limited time and you really want to uh probably get the most bang for your buck doing stuff like those uh to failure is one of the best ways to go about it yeah Okay, um, we were on the running question. We already talked about rehydrating for uh, before, during, and after workout. Are sports drinks necessary for the average home exerciser, or is water sufficient? Are no, they're not necessary. Or they're essentially just a Coca-Cola. Don't just I would stay away from them. Um, okay, now we are on to the new student ambassadors question: Is do you really need to cool down after your workout? If so, why and for how long? Okay. Yes, you do need to cool down after your workout. And uh, one of the main reasons for this is when you put yourself in a workout, you are changing your energy, uh, not your energy, but your uh, nervous system, okay? When we're at rest and we're just hanging out, we're kind of like in this household, just keeping, and we call it your parasympathetic nervous system. Once you go into an exercise, you're switching into your sympathetic nervous system, which is kind of that fight or flight, the lines chasing you, for lack of a better term, um, nervous system, and that's what you're in, and you want, when you are in that nervous system, you're on alert and you're not going to be able to rest and recover because you're everything is going elsewhere. OK, um, so it's important to put yourself back in that parasympathetic nervous system. And that can be done by some light foam rolling and stretching and honestly just laying down and doing some breathing techniques after a workout. So it is essential to your workout to do a cool down if you want to optimize your performance to the highest capacity that you want from your workout so yes cool down for how long again that's just person specific uh five to ten minutes is pretty good if you want to go through some other stuff and really you know do it maybe 15 minutes i wouldn't go any longer you could if you wanted to but maybe some breathing techniques some static stretching um just watching the clouds just really bringing yourself back not letting yourself stay in that high awareness state was there a question with that one okay um do 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 is swimming really one of the best exercises for you? Uh, while I, I hate swimming, it is great for you. Um, there is lots of things. And swimming can actually be if it's a very light swimming or being in the water can actually be used as a cool down. There's something with putting the body in water that brings it back to that uh, parasympathetic nervous system. But if you're swimming last and stuff, you're not going to be there because you're exercising. But the reason why it's really good for the body, especially if you're like me, you have lots of joint issues and stuff, is you're buoyant in the water, right? It's less impact on your body. When you're running, you're constantly putting stuff on your feet and stuff. When you're swimming, you're really gliding through it and you're not putting a lot of stress on your joints. Okay, and you're still able to really build that oxidative capacity. And honestly, like if you're doing breaststroke, oh man, like your triceps will be screaming, your lats are screaming, like you're you're getting a good workout in there too, and you're not 
put a lot of stress on the joints. Um, that would be the main reason why swimming is really good. That's why a lot of time when you come out of physical therapy and you're trying to recover, you're like, go swim first, right? It's going to get the blood moving. It's going to get the nutrients to go where they need to go and get the blood flowing go where it needs to go to help repair. But it's not going to put a lot of stress on that injured area or areas if you're me. Anything else from swimming? You're more of a swimmer than um, me. One of the... The concern with swimming for some people, not everyone, is Drowning. the bone. <laughs> yeah, that too. It's the bone mineral density. Okay? Oh, yeah. Because okay, it's that not makes... an impact type of activity um, that a lot of individuals who excessively, excessively use swimming as their primarily mode of exercise, right, may be putting themselves at a risk of um, osteopenia or osteoporosis later on. But that's only in few cases. Um, especially if there's any other concerns in terms of dietary intake, genetics, any other injuries. So swimming is one of the activities is not going to provide um, the stress needed to build strong bones. So uh, then that's a really important thing, especially for all the ladies out there. You want to incorporate some sort of strength training or some sort of impact because Wolf's Law states that when it's just like muscle. Once you put that stress on it, it breaks down the bone a little bit, and then you build it back up stronger. And if all you were doing was swimming, you don't get that benefit because you're really losing that impact. Um, so, again, doing one thing is not necessarily the best. Doing lots of things and lots of variety, just like with your diet and things like that, eating lots of different colorful things, eating lots of different you know, meats and things like that, having a big variety is very good. Okay. That's your question. Okay. Um, So this question is, when running, should you take walk or jog breaks? If so, how long before you start running again? Again, that just depends on uh, training age, who you are, what your goals are. If I was doing interval training and I was like doing uh, intense sprints, then I'm usually going to do a one to three ratio, right? I would do my sprint. If I sprinted for 20 seconds, then I'd rest for 60 seconds. Um, and when you first start out, if you were doing interval training, you'd probably do one to five, especially with sprinting because it's so tiring. Um, and then you slowly bring that down. Um, but if we're just talking about... You know, long distance running, what you're going to do is, uh, especially if you're just starting out, yeah, jog to where, you know, you're starting to get, to, you know, uncomfortable, go a little bit further and then maybe give yourself a break and then just walk. I, I wouldn't say stay still. I would say walk until you feel like you can go again and then go again and then maybe time those rest periods that you took and shorten them down and shorten them down. And then, okay, now I'm running a mile nonstop. Cool. Okay. Now I'm doing my mile. And uh, do I want to increase my intensity first? Do I want to increase my duration first? Usually ACSM is for general population. You increase your duration first. But if you want if you want to focus on, you know, getting a faster mile time, then focus on that intensity and going faster. It's whatever your goals really are. But the most important thing is to – your body is the best feedback that you have. Just listen to it. And if it's screaming and dying and your knees are hurting and your ankles are dying – you know, maybe take a break, um, especially if you're just starting out. If you've been doing it for a long period of time and you are that ultra marathon runner or something like that, you need to push through those things. But that's because that's your sport. For gen pop, you know, really listen to your body. Again, you're the runner. What else are you going to say here? Is that good yeah, enough? Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, once you get to whatever it is, you know, if your goal is to run a really fast three miles, I'm not going to tell you to run a mile and then stop and then run a mile, you know, but get to where you can run it comfortably and then get better at it uh, and I don't want to take away from not suffering right suffering through th certain things is good right it, it builds character and it helps you out but um, I'm not training for anything anymore you know I'm not you know an athlete anymore so I want well, I'm training for life now so I want my body to recover and be better and if that's what you're going for then listen to it but uh, you know still challenge yourself I don't want anyone to be um, blisses, you know. Uh, for beginners, next question is, so for beginners, what is the difference between hand weights, and I think this individual meant dumbbells by that, free weights and machines, do they provide different results? So let's think about this very simply, and just so we know, dumbbells and free weights are essentially the same thing. They're just a more uh, unstable fashion of like a barbell. So when we think about exercise or exercise equipment, if we're going to go from easiest to hardest, it would be like, you know, your machines is the easiest, has the most stability. It controls the pattern of what you're doing. If I want a chest press machine, it literally gives me 
starting point, end point, right? There's not all kinds of difference in it. Then may come some of those machines that do have a little bit of that stability, uh, those kind of uh, hoist machines and stuff like that. Then you're gonna come to like your cable machines. Those are a little bit more or less stable. Then you'll come to your free weight stuff, especially barbells. It's a lot more stability where your body has to stabilize it. And then your dumbbells, kettlebells, and things like that, it's much less stable. So the way working through those things is honestly just the amount of control that you have to put into it to stabilize it, right? So you will know from holding a barbell compared to a bench machine, there's a huge difference because you have to not only you usually when I'm doing a pressing machine, I'm only using the prime moving muscle, just my chest and my arms to move it. But when I'm holding a barbell, I have to engage all the natural stabilizers of my shoulder and of my lats and of my body to maintain that, right? So if you're just starting out, it's always good to start with machines and then move on to free weights and things like that. Just because you're 85 years old doesn't mean that you can't touch free weights. So you can get to those as well. As long as you have a good trainer that you know what you're doing, don't think that you can't do it. We do have a question from Emily. Hi, and Emily. Emily asks, what are your thoughts about CrossFit? Okay. I love my thoughts about CrossFit. So everyone always talks because I'm a functional movement guru kind of person and everyone thinks I'm going to hate CrossFit. And I don't hate CrossFit at all. Um, so a lot of you may know and may have heard that CrossFit has a lot, it reports lots of injuries. Okay. And again, this really gets honed in on because there are a certain population. So when it comes to the injury rate in CrossFit, I do not think it's a CrossFit issue. I, well, it kind of is, but I think it's a coach's issue because what happens when people are getting hurt a lot of time in CrossFit is they are doing certain exercises that are contraindicated for the given movement that they have in their body at that certain time. So how we kind of like, and what that means is there's certain, like if somebody has a shoulder mobility issue, they shouldn't be pressing overhead until they fix that shoulder mobility issue. If they have a hip hinging issue, they should not be doing deadlifting until they fix that hip hinging issue, okay? There's certain, and there's ways to identify if someone is deficient in a certain movement pattern, and there's certain steps that you can take to reestablish that movement pattern and then get them back to, into the exercise that you want them to do. So I don't think it's a CrossFit issue. I think there's certain coaches in CrossFit who just want to get people in and out. And it's like, okay, here's Grandma Betty. She's doing 45 snatches today, and she should not be doing that. She should first be assessed for her quality of movement and see what movements are contraindicated for her. And then she should be allowed to have exercises within the given wad where those – where the contraindicated movement pattern is put and have those corrective strategies put there instead. So she doesn't have to get removed from the wad necessarily. She can still do the entire workout and get the metabolic output that is so desired through CrossFit. But during exercises that are contraindicated for her, they're swapped out for a corrective strategy that either elicits the same metabolic response that does not put her in that contraindicated position or is an exercise that allows her to utilize a corrective strategy to reestablish that position. And then in the warm-ups and cool-downs of those, uh, of those uh, uh, boxes and things like that, they should implement certain you know, warm-ups that apply to all those movement patterns and then give certain individuals uh, the correct strategies that are uh, inherently bad in that uh, individual person. Um, our CrossFit like uh, program here, I developed a functional kind of CrossFit program that I gave to our, the person who oversees our CrossFit, and we have very minimal injuries that actually happen. I think CrossFit is very cool for the community that it has. I mean, when you look at professional CrossFit athletes, there's no, you know, there's no line that they don't look great. They do crazy things. Like it is the ultimate exercise out there. It is gymnastics, Olympic lifting, um, crazy kind of stuff. Like what people can do is absolutely amazing. But people should work up to those things. They should not be thrown in the lion's den right away. They should be properly taught how to do these movements, and they should properly have. Uh, establish the correct movement patterns before they do a hundred reps of them or something like that. People always think I'm gonna have beef with CrossFit, but I don't. Um, I think it. I, I love watching it. I think it's really cool to watch and stuff. But there just there can be dangers in any type of strength training routine that you do. Thank you, Ramon. And we are about at time. Okay. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight, and thank you, Dina, for adding in um, some really great information on the scientific aspects and the supplemental aspects and running. Is there any closing thoughts that you would like to add, Ramon? My closing thoughts would be with anything that you do, whether it be nutrition or strength training, you should utilize variety, okay? Experience new things. Don't get comfortable in one routine because once you get comfortable, that's when you're going to stop optimizing to be able to better yourself. So can you use variety? Try things that you're not cool with, like a pitcher. And <laughs> we got a new piece of equipment at the gym, and she was not trying to use it, but now, now she's all about it. 
Um, and uh, same thing with diet and stuff. And we're going to talk about that. So come to my, uh, if you're coming to Rendezvous, come to my How to Shop for Real Food. And we're going to talk about how to make tips and tricks for being able to create variety and eat healthy and make it cheap and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but yeah, thank you for your time. And uh, uh, I hope to see you all this weekend. We hope to see you all this weekend. Correct. Thanks, everyone. Good night.